Hi, this is Charlie for Vintage Speed. This is our second video on the Rochester two barrel. We're doing a primary carburetor at this point. The later videos will be doing the secondary carburetors to show you. These were the carburetors we took apart. Our carburetors all been cleaned and finished and ready to go back together. This video, we're gonna do the body section and the top and uh, and then on the, the next video, we'll do the base assembly in the final. All right, we're going to start out with our body section here. The first thing it's a good idea to do if, is to check your holes and make sure your holes are clean. Uh, a lot of times, you'll get this thing all back together. Everything will appear to be cleaned, and then you'll get them where the, the screws won't go in. So it's a good idea to run a 1032 tap down your screw holes. You've got your eight top screw holes, run your tap down in here and tap out those holes. Uh, that's 1032. And then I like to tap out these cluster screw holes with an 832 tap and make sure you take like a pick and go down in there and make sure that that's blown out good. And uh, because you don't want that screw to bottom out before it tightens the cluster down. All right, uh, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna install the cluster and the, the pump check. Now, uh, after you've blown out all your passages, this is your pump check right here. You wanna make sure that this, this passage is open into your pump well. That's where the ball seats down in there for your pump check. So once you're checking, make sure that's open. Another thing I might mention to you that some of the carburetors have a, an open hole right here in the bottom of the bowl. And they use a ball in the bottom that the pump spring, the return spring, held the ball in. Um, the new style pumps that we're using today are self-loading. And the way they work is on the upstroke, the cup comes away from this plastic and it loads the pump through these slots right here. And it's loaded through this slot here. All the carburetors have that slot in them. Some of them that used a leather pump used an inlet check ball and, and um, a hole here in the base. What I'd advise doing is just go ahead and plug that hole off. You can, we use a lead ball. You can plug it off with uh, JB Quick or, or uh, seal that hole off. And because you're gonna be using the late style pump that, uh, that self loads. So this pump loads through this slot in the well, and uh, don't worry about that because the leather pumps are no longer available, so it's a real hard item to find. Okay, there's um, uh, your your check ball. In the kits, there'll be two balls. There'll be a steel ball and an aluminum ball. The aluminum ball was made to go in the bottom of the pump well, so you won't be using that one. Make sure you use the correct ball because they're different size. You want to use the steel ball the shiny steel ball, and it goes right in this pump check hole right here. Drop it down in that hole, and then you have this, this little fine wire spring. And another thing I might add is make sure that you look at this spring carefully because these springs are so fine, a lot of carbs will come in here and the pump won't work, and it's because there's two springs pushed together and the guys don't notice it. It's real hard to tell if you've got two pushed together, so make sure you've only got one spring because if you put two on there, your pump won't work. Okay, then your spring goes in there, and then you have the little thing called a T-bar, and that little T-bar goes right down in the spring and goes in that slot. And uh, that you can just tap down in there and it should lock into place sometimes they're a little tighter you might have to take a little punch and punch it down in there but but uh, once your t-bar is installed that include that's your pump check okay the next thing we're going to talk about is clusters um, there's quite a few different clusters for these things uh, they made a lot of different part numbers I've always said that there's over 700 different part numbers for the small base Rochester um, there's linkage differences, there's venturi size differences, um, there's a zillion different casting numbers for these things. 
but basically they're all the same. Most of your passenger car carburetors are going to be inch and three thirty seconds. And if you look, it'll be it'll be stamped right there on the Venturi. There's raised letters. It says inch and three thirty seconds. Um, the tri power end carburetors, the original ones, were a little larger. They were inch and a quarter. Um, there's a there's some that came on Novas and Chevy twos that were inch and an eighth. And there were also some that came on uh, little four-cylinder Pontiac Iron Dukes and some of the uh, the uh, boat motors uh, that Chris Kraft and uh, Gray Marine uh, and Merck Cruiser used on little four-cylinder engines that were actually one-inch Venturi. Uh, you don't see many of those, but uh, uh, generally you're going to find most of your passenger car carburetors are inch and three thirty seconds, and they make excellent tri-power carburetors. Now understand. We're building this as a tri-power system, but this is basically a passenger car two-barrel. The primary carburetor is pretty much the same uh, in the tri-power center as it is in if you were using it on a manifold as a single carburetor. There are some varying differences, and I'll show you what they are. Uh, mainly, it has to do with the setting on the power valve piston and some other things, but for a general rule, uh, you don't have to worry about that. Okay, now on your clusters, there's... Uh, there's what we call an early, an early cluster, which is this cluster, and it uses this indentation in it, and the like little scallop there. Um, basically, if you're doing a rebuild on them, you're going to see which cluster you've got. You've got the late cluster, like this, and it uses a different gasket. It uses a wider gasket. Okay, yeah. On the top here, on a primary carb, uh, these are these little tubes right here are the air bleeds and uh, that is the air bleeds for your idle circuit uh, and and the reason they put these little tubes in here is they're de-icer tubes they uh, they keep the the air bleed from icing up M most of the carburetors won't have these a lot of them will if uh, if they're in there you can leave them in on your primary carburetor if you're doing it as a secondary carburetor i usually just take a pair of side cutters and pull them out because you don't need them because you're not using the idle circuits. But on the on the primary, you want to make sure that uh, that uh, if they're in there, go ahead and leave them in. Make sure that you've got the proper gasket that the gasket fits there and fits there. There are some there are some variations in these cluster gaskets, and there were some clusters that have a little raised place right here. And we get carburetors in here all the time that they've put the, the cluster with that raised place. Those were on Oldsmobiles and Pontiacs. Um, and if you try to put it in this carburetor, when you go to tighten it down, it, the cluster won't go. The carburetor that uses that has a slot right here for, for, the, for the raised bar to go in. And we'll get into that later when we get into it. Okay, um, as, far as, your, as far as your cluster, since we're building this for a tri-power, these are your main well pickups. Okay, these are your idle pickup tubes. This picks up your idle circuit. Actually, what it does is the fuel is picked up here. It comes up, it picks air, bleed air up here, and goes over and goes back down this hole. And it goes down these holes and comes out here. And that goes down to your base for your idle circuit. And your main well circuits are, are your center one. You want to make especially tr true, this is very important, that this cluster is completely clean. Um, it's best to get you either a little torch tip cleaner or um, in the case of what we use we use a real fine wire spring and make sure that your squirter passage holes are open and they're located right here and your air bleed holes for your main circuit are open and they're right here so you got those four some of the carburetors will have an additional air bleed here uh, generally on a tri-power what we'll do is we'll take a little bit of JB quick and plug that you you don't want it the later carburetors as they were getting into emissions had a lot of bleed air to try to lean out the circuits to make them run leaner um, on a tri-power you, you don't you don't want to lean that bleed air out so much that you don't uh, you, you don't uh, get enough fuel into your idle circuit so if you've got uh, bleed holes right here I normally plug them now we use lead balls to plug everything you can on stuff like this use DevCon or, or JB Quick. Just put a dab on it to seal the hole off. Okay, same thing with your idle pickups. You want to make sure that, that, that these tubes are clean and that these tube holes are clean. Um, 
since we're doing this for a tri power what you want to make sure is you want to make sure that you're getting enough fuel down to overcome any leakage you might have through a secondary basis and i don't care how a secondary base is built and ours are probably the most precise in the industry uh, you will end up you'll get a little uh, uh, air intrusion through your secondaries it's just not physically possible not to do it so what you want to do is well, generally we find for a 350 engine that we want we want to enlarge the holes here uh, 34 to 35 thousandths the bigger the engine the bigger the holes if you're running a 383 stroker you may have to take these out to somewhere around 38 to 40 thousandths to get enough idle fuel pickup Make sure that bleed hole on the side is plugged off and these holes here, your bleed holes are fine. Okay, once you get that done and everything's cleaned out and you can blow through this and make sure your tubes are open. You can feel the air coming out the other side. Once you make sure everything's open, you're sure your cluster gaskets is right. You've got your check valve in, then you can insert your cluster in. A lot of these carburetors, or I will say most of them, came with a a well that went there an aluminum well uh, do I have one here um, it's a little uh, aluminum piece that fit down in here and it had the uh, holes pressed in it uh, we don't use those in the carburetors I don't find that they do any good over the years um, I've taken them out you can put them in if you want to it doesn't hurt anything the idea was to keep air bubbles from forming around your 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 main pickup tubes and your main wells here uh, so but basically we don't use them in the carburetor we don't find that they do anything so that's thing, something you can either use them it don't hurt if you put them in uh, but if you leave them out it won't hurt either okay now you go ahead and insert your cluster down in push it into place okay on your cluster screws your cluster screws those holes which I also run a tap through those are 832 and you, your two cluster screws go here this is a special screw the front one as you notice there's no threads up top and the body of it is cut down and the reason for that is is because your squirter fuel comes in comes across and this seals off your this seals off so your fuel's flowing around it so you'll find that there's a little hard fiber red gasket in there make sure that's that's in place and then you can go ahead and tighten everything down This is the cluster is the brain of the carburetor so you want to make sure that all those passages are completely clean don't uh, don't try to shortchange the cluster because if you do you'll find out you'll have problems when you go to test the carburetor you'll find out you either don't have a squirt out of one of them because it's and it doesn't take much to plug that little hole for the squirter so snug that cluster down good and tight Okay, there's your fuel cluster installed. Okay, the next thing we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna put a new set of jets in it. What size were these, John? 55s. Or uh, 56s, but... That's yeah. fine. Okay, um, this carburetor flows at sea level in the middle of the fuel curve with a 55-56 jet with the inch and 330 seconds Venturi. We normally, Dependent on the cubic inches of the motor, if it's a 350, we normally run 56 jets in the primary and 55s on the outside and the secondaries. If your engine's a little larger, up in the 383 to 400 inch class, then you can uh, you can uh, upsize these jets a little bit. And here again, when you're putting the jet in, just put it in snug. You don't have to wrench down on them. You got to think about that poor guy that's going to take it apart the next time, and it may be you. So, uh, so make sure that you don't bring them down too tight. I have 
I have every part and piece for this carburetor available. You can buy fuel clusters, you can buy screw kits, you can buy jets, you can buy brand new power valves that we make. Um, so uh, all that stuff's available. Okay, after your jets are in, we're gonna put our, our power valve in. Um, our power valve, we make these brand new on a screw machine. They encompass a little needle and there's a spring inside and a, uh, a little flange that goes in there that holds it all together. So when you're inst installing your power valve, you wanna make sure that you use either a power valve wrench or you use a screwdriver with that slot cut in it like that right there. And the reason for that is, is because this little brass stem is very critical. If you bend that stem at all, that power valve will not seat and what will happen is is it'll cause you to have a path bypass fuel and it'll leak so you want to make sure that you're very careful with this thing that your screwdriver stays centered and that you uh, you go ahead and put your power valve in and with the gasket on it okay there she is installed all right um, now I guess we're gonna go to the top assembly um, okay, our, our Rochester top is done. Uh, this is a idle vent right here. Um, we just put a we just put a plug in it. We have these plugs available. We put a plug in it. We don't use the idle vent. It's not necessary. So uh, uh, that's one of the things you can eliminate from the carburetor if you want to. Okay, uh, your um, your uh, choke. Now you're going to find that if you want to run this with a manual or electric choke, there's differences in them, and I'll do a video on the electric choke to show you. But uh, generally, we sell a choke bracket for the tri-powers, and I recommend running a manual choke. Uh, a lot of instances you won't even need the choke, but if you if you do, uh, you can take your take your choke shaft, put your choke shaft in. This piece right here is um, is on the mounts on there just like that goes against that little stop okay now we use the regular choke shaft that came a lot of these will have a vacuum pull off on them we just use the choke shaft and then we put an arm on it because the only the only carburetors that Rochester made that had manual chokes on them were on the trucks and the truck top is very difficult to find there's hardly any of them left so uh, so we just use a, a we could we do a conversion on this and put the choke in it all right we're going to put our choke plate in. And your choke plate goes right in there. I will note that there are two two different types of, of choke plates. There's a choke plate like this that's square on both sides. And there's also one There's one like this that you'll see that's rounded on the end. So uh, they, they're not interchangeable. You've got to use the one with the right flange on it if you want it to work. But uh, basically they all assemble the same way. Okay, now I've talked about this in other videos, but we're gonna go back into it again. Uh, your, uh, uh, your, your throttle plate and your choke lever screw, your choke shaft screws have a little indentation on them. A lot of people will take and uh, they'll, uh, They'll brat them over. You can do that, but we don't recommend it. Um, we told you in the disassembly, we use Loctite. Use red Loctite to put your choke shaft screws in. And this is really effective. Just put you a dab of Loctite on there and put your choke shaft in. Once this Loctite sets, uh, if you have to take your choke plate back out, don't try to just turn the screw out or you'll twist the screw off. It really locks these screws down tight. The best thing to do then is to just take a, a little propane torch and heat up the, where the choke screw is, and uh, that'll soften the Loctite to a point where the screw will come back out. But don't try to take them out cold. If you do, you're going to find out you're ending up with a, 
a screw broke off in the shaft and since these shafts are aluminum it's hard to drill them out they can be done but it's not it's not something that's easily done okay there's there's your there's your choke plate in okay now we're going to put go to our pump circuit here okay your pump uh, fulcrum arm here this controls your pump from your throttle body the rod coming up it controls your pump the action of your pump going up and down in your pump well okay um, what you want to do if you find out that this is really really wobbly this one's pretty good uh, if they're really worn out here uh, we have a bushing kit you can you can drill this and put a brass bushing in it and take that back to the proper size which is quarter of an inch also when you slide this in you want you don't want there to be uh, a lot of clearance this way in it when you put your end on it so if there is we also have these we have these little spacer washers that are made out of nylon you can slide them on this end of the shaft and put that in and that that takes the, the play out of there so that you end up with a good tight pump circuit okay your uh, once you get that on you can insert your Is that supposed to other way? Flip, flip around. There you go. Usually these aren't that hard to get on the There we go. Okay, once that slips on this this part of the flange will go down into a little notch there and once it is hold them together and go ahead and tighten this down and that's what it should look like okay now your pump then goes on here and if we first we have to assemble the pump okay the pump uses a delayer spring like this and uh, you want to insert your delayer spring on there and then well, this is the type of retainer cap we use you hold your spring down boy that's a tight spring and snap it in and that's just the way it works and this is where your delayer is in your pump okay now your pump goes in here some of your pumps are held on there's several different clips here and you can pretty much look at them and tell how they work but some of them are held on with a c-clip some of them are held on with a hair plant pin clip some of them don't need a clip at all so uh, go ahead and search your hair pin clip in there and to make sure that your pump is operation is good which this one appears to be good all right the next thing we're going to do is we're going to put in our fuel valve now you can use the standard needle and seat we use these roto discs. We like these better because the the needle and seats have a uh, uh, number one. Uh, you have to be concerned with float drop. Number two, they have a Buna rubber tip on them or Viton. And what happens is is that the gas additives today tends to swell that tip up and distort it, and you get fuel passage. This roto disc, as we call them, uses a little Teflon round Teflon wafer in there that shuts the fuel off. And the Teflon is inert, so it does not bother. Make sure you put your gasket on there and go ahead and tighten down your, your fuel inlet. Here again, that doesn't need to be really tight, just snug. All right. Now we're ready for a top gasket. And our we're going to put the power valve piston in first okay uh, if you're using this as a tri-power carburetor I would advise that you buy our new power valve piston um, these these are set at about 9 to 10 hg is where these the stock power valve piston spring is set we have a reduced value spring that drops this down to five which uh, allows you to, uh, if you're running any cam in your motor, it, uh, it allows your power valve to stay closed 
under lower vacuum situations. So um, if, you, if you're building that, has this one uh, been modified? Okay. Um, if you're building a, a, a tri-power and you're using this on a, as a tri-power center carburetor, I would advise you purchase one of our pistons. We have these brand new. And uh, I usually put a little drop of oil on it and insert the power piston. And this goes in, this goes in uh, into a little recess here. Okay, once you, once you get that flange down in the recess, like that, make sure that your piston is straight and that it's working good. Then you just take your a little screwdriver or a punch and stake over the, the, the edge on about three places like that. And what that does is it locks your piston in and that's the way the factory did it. So your, this, should, this should operate like that. This is where your vacuum signal comes in from your base to your power valve piston. And understanding how the power valve works in this system, um, this, this is a normally open switch. When the car is shut off, this piston is down like it is now. And when it's down, it's depressed the needle, which opens the power valve. So your needle's depressed. As soon as you, cr as soon as you start the motor and you get vacuum underneath your throttle plate, uh, the vacuum signal comes up through here and pulls this, pist this piston up. And when it does is it pulls it up off of this needle right here. And when the, when the, it comes up off the needle, it shuts the fuel off. So as long as, as long as the vacuum signal stays above the pressure of that spring, the power valve will stay closed. If you get into a low vacuum situation, like if you're climbing a hill or passing a car, um, especially holds true with heavy vehicles, uh, the vacuum will drop down and the spring will overcome that and it'll depress the needle and enrich the circuit to give you more power. So that's what it is. It's a power. That's a power valve. Um, okay, uh, we're ready to put our top gasket on. There's several different styles of these top gaskets too. Uh, we sell one, one that's a universal one. It's got these holes already cut for the lineup pins, and we find that these work real good. So. Um, they come in our kits and they fit. We have several different gaskets in that kit that fit uh, that fit all of them. All right, now your float. Your float is uh, either brass or nitrofill, depending on which float you're using. is is set in there, and it goes. Scoot that pin over to this side so that when your top goes on, it clears the pin. So you want it there. Okay, now. On the on the float adjustment all right um, when if you're using if you're using a standard needle and seat then you'll have to set your float drop and you can set that float drop by this tang right here if you're using our roto disc you don't have to worry about the drop because all you have to worry about here is this is looking through that little window right there on the side of the, the float. As long as your little flap is open, that's all the drop you need, okay? But for your level, it's, it's important that you set your float level. Now, we found through trial and error and building hundreds of these systems over the years we, that uh, on a brass float, You'll see where it's soldered together there, and you'll feel there's a little rough edge there on where it's soldered together. What you want to do is you want to measure from that rough edge down to the gasket, and you want it to be three quarters of an inch. So you're going from the bottom here, this little rough edge, you can feel it with your finger, and you want to go three quarters of an inch. Okay, that's your float setting. On your drop, like I said, as long as you don't let your drop go down so far that your float hits the bottom of the bowl, the drop on this type of needle and seat 
is irrelevant because it's captured. The needle can't fall out. And all you're interested in doing is opening that little window to let the fuel in. So um, these fuel valves, another good thing about them is, is they're self-cleaning. Where you have a, a needle going into a, a cone, going into a recess, you can get stuff trapped. When this opens up, it opens up wide open. So it, if there's anything in there, it usually will blow it right through if you got a little grain of, of something in there that's causing you to uh, uh, cause your needle and seat to stick. These don't tend to stick. Okay, now the other thing you want to watch here is, and this one's good, is you want to watch this little tang right here. When the float's in the closed position, you want this little tang to be flush with the top of the, of the, um, of the needle and seat. If it's not, the way to, to, to change that is the kits come with different thicknesses of gaskets. If you've got to raise it, you just take your needle and seat out and put a little thicker gasket in it. Or if it's too high, put a little thinner gasket in it. I think all of our kits come with like four different gaskets and they're different thicknesses. So you make sure that when that float's closing to get the max, maximum effect of your float and your fulcrum, you want this when it's in, in the closed position, you want this little flap right here to be perfectly perpendicular when it touches the top of that. So that's adjusted by the thickness of the gasket. Okay, this top is completed. And uh, the next thing we're gonna do is we're going to, uh, we're gonna test it. And basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna test the squirters um, to make sure that we're, there we're getting fuel out of our pump circuit. Okay, and the way we do that is, like I told you before, we want to use, you want to use either mineral spirits or paint thinner here, and uh, and depress your, depress your pump, and make sure you're getting a good positive squirt out of your squirters, which you should be doing there. I think this pump, pump cup is... Bad. Let me get another pump. Okay, that's what you should see. A good, see the good positive squirt out of both squirters? Okay, that tells you your pump circuit's working good. Okay, and then you can take the fuel back out of the bowl. And go ahead and, uh, and blow out your carburetor. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is we're ready to put our top on. What we're going to do is you have a, a, a pump return spring that goes under your, under your main pump well. It goes in here and make sure your gasket's in place. And what I like to do is I like to put a little bit of oil on the pump cup. And if you note here, uh, never never use never use the black boon or rubber cup like this never use it with today's fuel uh, you you've got to use the fluorastomer cups that are the blue or orange cups they're a, they're a synthetic rubber these are made out of boon or rubber and if you put them in there they won't last two weeks they'll swell up and it'll lock your linkage up and the dang darn things will fall apart so once you get it in there put your little bit of oil down in the pump well your little tip on this pump goes right in that spring. And put your top on. All right, your top screws. All of our rebuilds, we use all brand new stainless steel screws. Like I told you before, these are 1032 by one inch. And uh, there's eight screws total. Seven of them are 1032 by one inch. One of them that goes in this high part right here is 1032 by inch and a half. It's a longer screw. So you can put those in. And I'm gonna just for speed, I'm gonna go ahead and, and put these on with a screw gun. All 
I'm running them down, but I'm not tightening them. I'm going to show you, which I've shown in previous videos, is uh, the biggest mistake people make on all carburetors is they they tighten these top screws down way too far. And the reason for that is is they think they're they're stopping leaks, but the fuel level is down approximately a half to five eighths of an inch in this bowl. There's never any fuel up on this gasket unless you go around a corner and splash it up there. You're not going to get fuel on that part of it anyway. So uh, there's no real need. Uh, don't you have a? Where's my other Phillips? So here's the procedure for tightening down a top screw. And this is true on all these carburetors. You, your split ring lock washer there, I tighten it down until, until it comes to a stop, okay? And then I give it about a quarter of a turn, and that's all you need. They're, they're, uh, you'll, you'll see that washer will crush, and when it crushes down and it stops, then give it a quarter of a turn, and that's all they need. What happens is if you tighten them down too tight, is you'll warp things. Now, the Rochesters are not as bad about warping as some of these other carburetors. Uh, the Strombergs and the Hollies are notorious about warping. And I, guys just keep tightening the things down thinking they're stopping the leaks and they're not really stopping the leaks. Okay, there's your, uh, there's your carburetor, your primary carburetor. Pump's working good, choke's working good. In our next video, we're going to install the fast idle lever, the base, and we're going to put the choke on it. We're going to put the fuel inlet on it, the fuel inlet filters, and button this thing up. So that'll be the next part of this video is to finish the primary carburetor. And then I'm going to do a, a video to show you how to do the secondaries and install our secondary aluminum throttle bodies. Give us a call, vintagespeed.com. Uh, it's www.vintagespeed.com is our online catalog. You can order any parts or pieces you need for these, including carb kits. Or you can reach me here. I'm Charlie, 772-778-0809 in Florida. And thank you very much, and I'll see you on the final assembly of this carburetor.